Are there any questions on the sermon this morning? Not seeing any questions. All right, we are going to turn our attention to the Belgic Confession, and actually, I did get it right. So let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 11. We're not going to read the Belgic Confession this morning, just again, um, sort of filling in the blanks that aren't there. Romans chapter 9 through 11 deals with Paul's consideration of the placement of Israel in the new covenant in God's redemptive plan. And we don't have the time to read chapters 9, 10, and 11, but I do like to take the time to read all of chapter 11. So please follow as I read this. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking? The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their tra table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut, uh, if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivative olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have become disobedient 
in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. All right, so if you have your, your um, bulletins and you're taking notes, um, sometimes my margins shift when I send this bulletin. So actually, under Romans 11:26, we need a big blank here for notes, and I do not have it there. So when we look at number four, we're going to spend most of the service on the salvation of Israel 4.2. And so you'll see if you flip plates, there's no room. So you'll want to write your notes on the back of your bulletin if that's still open, if you haven't used that. Again, so we probably won't get to, uh, well, probably not beyond the Great Tribulation if we get that far. But anyways, what we're going to pick up this morning are the signs of the millennium signs that pertain specifically to the coming of Jesus Christ as we draw nearer to that. And what we saw, not to repeat everything from last week, but we saw that as we think about the signs of the times, typically Christians think about signs of judgment, wars, rumors of wars, famine, plagues, pestilence, etc. And what we find in the Gospel of Matthew is that one of the predominant signs is that the gospel will go forward to the ends of the world. And so when we think of signs of the times, we want to first think about signs of God's grace, and then secondly, signs of God's judgment. But thinking, first of all, signs of God's grace as a sign that we are in the last age, that we are approaching the moment of Christ's return, we're thinking signs of God's grace in two ways. First of all, the ingathering of the Gentiles, which is what we looked at last week. And now we want to see a second component, the ingathering of Israel, of the Jewish people and the Jewish race. So if you look at your bulletin, signs number four of the present working and triumph of God's grace, we saw last week 4.1, the preaching of the gospel, and 4.2 today, the salvation of all Israel. And the question that is put to us uh, comes to us from Romans 11, verse 26, where Paul says, in this way all Israel will be saved. And the question for us as we think of signs of God's grace as a sign of the age, the end of the age, the question is, do we expect some kind of massive return of the Jews or a partial return of the Jews? Or are the Jews just sort of that was their period in history and God has moved on and now we're just gathering Gentiles and then the end will come. This is a very important subject in eschatology, particularly as we think about the premillennial view, which says that Jesus Christ's return, so there's the rapture, a secret rapture, Christ has gone with his church for seven years up in heaven. During those seven years, there's intense tribulation, but then in the premillennial view, Christ returns with his church and he rules on the world for a thousand years specifically for the purpose of gathering the Jews. So you see, this is a very, very important view among the premillennialists, and it's important for us to be able to answer that, uh, whether or not we disagree with their construction of the timeline of events, we can at least set that aside and say, uh, are they correct or would we agree? Does the Bible teach that there will be some kind of an ingathering of the Jews before Jesus returns? And that is the question that Paul takes up in Romans chapter 9 through 11. And so let me just give you a sort of a summary statement. As I read these chapters and understand them and others as well, it does not seem that God's salvation of the Gentiles is to the exclusion of his salvation of the Jews. The Gentiles are not a substitution to the Jews. 
Gentile believers do not replace Israel. So if you read some theology, there's something actually called replacement theology, which teaches that the Gentile church essentially replaces the Jews. But when you read Romans 11, you'll see that Paul presents to us one church. And this is where we actually do distinguish ourselves from uh, premillennialists, which basically has a Gentile church and a Jewish church. And Jesus comes back for the Jews in their view. Whereas it seems really clear from Scripture that God has always had one people, beginning with Adam and Eve. And, uh, you know, you think of Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, I, I think it's Ephesians 4, there's, there's one God and Father of us all, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one people. Christ is one bride, not two brides. There's one temple. There's one flock with one shepherd. All of the images, there's one household of God, not two. Uh, all the teaching of Scripture presents to us that there's one people. And so that is borne out in Romans chapter 11, where there is a olive tree, not two. And branches were broken off, and Gentile branches are grafted in. There's not two trees. There's one people. And so I just say that sort of as an outset. So there, there's one people. In the Old Testament, it's called Israel. In the New Testament, it's called the church. But it's always been the same. God has had one, one people that he has covenanted with in grace. That's sort of just as an uh, a introduction to this. So Romans chapter 9 through 11 is a key text. And if you will, just turn back to Romans 9 for a moment. And you'll see that before Romans chapter 9 is Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 is this glorious chapter about the triumph of the gospel. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present nor things to come, new, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grand finale, trumpets are blasting. This is glorious. Paul here celebrates the gospel that has gone forth and that has brought salvation to the Gentiles that he has pastored. But it begs the question, as we come to this high pinnacle of chapter 8, it begs the question, what about the Jews? Will they share in this triumph and this victory? That is the question to which Paul brings us in chapter 9, 10, and 11. Have the Jews been cut off completely? If that were the case, then it would appear that God's promise to Abraham has failed. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? That's what Paul is, is wrestling with in these three chapters. Um, and the point that Paul brings to us is that the salvation of Gentiles is not to the exclusion or replacement of the Jews. Go to Romans, and, and so Paul answers this in a couple ways. We begin Paul's answer in Romans chapter 9, verse 11, where Paul says here, uh, though they were not yet born or had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau, but Esau I hated. So Paul answers the question of whether or not God has just abandoned the Jews, they were there for a purpose, but now his attention is on Gentiles. Paul answers the question with the, with the answer of election. And his point is this. Paul says in a sense, let's be clear. God's purpose was never to begin with to save all the Jews, period. And he demonstrates God's purpose of election by how God did not choose Ishmael, Abram's firstborn, and chose Isaac, his secondborn. And then again, when uh, we go on to the next generation, God bypassed the firstborn Esau and chose the secondborn Jacob. So Paul shows us in these two ways, Ishmael versus Isaac, Esau versus Jacob, that God's intention toward Israel was always driven by his sovereign decision in election. Never to choose every Jew, but to choose some amongst the Jews who he would bring to life in Christ. And so 
um, that is Paul's uh, point. And if you go to chapter 9, verse 27, he, he goes beyond um, Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau. Now he starts quoting Isaiah because Isaiah is wrestling with the same concept. He sees all of Israel being carted off to Babylon. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. So as Paul reasons through this in his mind, what about the Jews? He reminds his audience and us that what about the Jews should be qualified that God was never, never planned to save all the Jews to begin with. Even in Isaiah's day, there would be a remnant, not an entirety that would be saved. In chapter 10, Paul just really focuses on the power of the gospel in contrast with their unbelief. And yet the gospel, the message would go forward, and through the message of the gospel, people will be saved. He picks up this whole idea of election again in chapter 11. And he's still working through this. And he shows once again, and now to Romans chapter 11, Elijah is bemoaning the fact that Israel seems to be withering on the vine, so to speak. And in verse 4, God says, but what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul couples with this doctrine of election also now the idea of the gospel or the, the promise of preservation. That even in the most dire times of the Jewish history of the people of God in the Old Covenant, God always preserved his elect. Even if they were small, whittled down to 7,000, the Lord had a chosen people, and now Paul says in chapter 11, and he preserved them. God would always have a people worshiping his name. The reason Paul makes this point in chapter 11 <clears throat> is because um, otherwise the unbelief of the Jews would appear to nullify God's promise to Abraham. See, Paul needs to say, he's looking as Paul's writing Romans, he's thinking, what about the Jews? And he sees all their unbelief. And he needs to answer that unbelief. And his answer is election and preservation. And see, if he didn't have those answers, then the unbelief of the Jews would seem to suggest that God has failed, that his promise has failed, that his covenant with Abraham has failed. Uh, and, and Paul says, no, his covenant didn't fail. There's still a remnant, and they're being preserved. It's small. But their unbelief, the unbelief of the rest, this is Paul's point, the unbelief of the rest does not negate the covenant with Abraham. It will be fulfilled. Because remember, God's covenant with Abraham was to bless him and his posterity and the nations. It's not either or, it's both and. It's Abraham and the Jewish race and the Gentiles. He would be the father of many nations. And so Paul here is shown in Romans 9 and Romans 11 that God here has not abandoned the biological race of Abraham. He will still bring them grace even as he is bringing grace to the Gentiles. And now let's just bring this forward. So as we think, as Paul here is thinking about this at verse 1 of chapter 11, God has not yet not rejected his people. Paul here expects that there will still be Jews being converted, that God has not abandoned them, that the Gentiles have not replaced the Jews. Think of these little pieces of puzzle that we're going to lay together now. Even in Paul's day, Paul is preaching in Romans chapter 11. He says, I'm preaching to the Gentiles, and I'm hoping and praying that it makes the Jews jealous and that they start pressing into the kingdom and being converted by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and you think of it, like this, when think of Paul's letters, Ephesians, Galatians, particularly Galatians, but also Ephesians, Colossians. Almost in all of Paul's letters, there's a constant polemic with the Jews. Jews are saying we need to abide by the feast days. We need to abide by the dietary laws. Paul is saying, no, we don't. The very presence of that, that argument in these texts, in these verses, says what? It says that these churches were half Jew, half Gentile. <clears throat> 
says that this was the hot button issue they, these churches were wrestling with. The, the Jews are saying, all you Gentiles need to be convert, uh, circumcised. And Paul's writing, no. See, Paul's letters, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says to the congregation in Ephesus, a real congregation, he says, the middle wall dividing Jew and Gentile has been eroded. There's neither Jew nor Gentile anymore. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So the point is, as Paul writes in Romans 11 about God turning grace to the Jews, we must see that that already is occurring as Paul writes these letters because that's the major point in Paul's letters. So many Jews were being converted that he had to write to these congregations that were half Jew, half Gentile to show them how to live together and worship together. That's one point. Um, these letters of Paul show that there were sizable Jewish numbers in the churches that he planted. Furthermore, by habit, Paul would always go to the synagogue first in every single city that he preached. That also shows us that Paul himself, though a, a, an apostle to the Gentiles, always went to the Jew first and then to the Greek. It was Paul's habit to bring the gospel to the Jews, believing, as he writes here in Romans 11, that the Jews would be converted as well. We might also <clears throat> take note of Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that says that a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So that's the first thing I want to underscore, is that did the Gentiles replace the Jews? Not at all. We were grafted into, not to the nation of Israel, we were grafted into the true Israel. The true Israel is the people of God. The people not of biological race, but the people as Paul describes it in Romans chapter 9, the people of the promise. Okay, So God is one people, and among the Jews, his intent was never to save them all, but to re re retain his elect. There was a remnant among the Jews, and we see that already in Paul's lifetime. Jews are being converted in great numbers. That being said, now we go a little bit further um, and we look at Romans 11, verse 25, and we're, we're asking in verse 26, and we're saying, okay, a lot of Jews have been converted. And actually, one more thing I will actually say here uh, in addition, no, no, I'll save this for later. Um, so we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, that being said, do we expect there to be an influx of Jews in some dramatic fashion before Jesus Christ returns? And that is what we're trying to wrestle with is here, um, what is Paul saying in verse 11, 26, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Uh, I believe that God's, one of the signs of the times is the preaching of the gospel amongst the world to the nations, and also an ingathering of Jews. Now, we can't say definitively how big that will be, how many that will be, but it does seem that that, that is what Paul here is talking about. And I'll, I'll say this at this moment too, uh, we should not underestimate how many Jews today believe in Jesus. I think sometimes we forget that we read a passage like this, the signs of the times, when we, we expect some massive repentance going among Israel, but I had the blessing when I was living in France to spend Christmas in Israel and in the city of Tel Aviv on Shabbat, I gathered together with a church full of Jews worshiping Jesus. There are churches throughout Israel of Jews today who worship Jesus Christ. So my point has been through this uh, series is that Christ could return this afternoon and all of scripture will have been fulfilled. So we ought to believe that there were Jews in Paul's day coming in, in in great numbers so that he had to deal with that problem. And there are Jewish churches today who worship Jesus. That's what I wanted to state. Now here, what about an in-gathering, some sort of a, a more um, substantial gathering? Is there perhaps an indication that that can be expected? And I think it could be. All Israel, in verse 26, all Israel will be saved, has been defined in three ways. If you wanted to write this down, you don't have to. Israel as a totality, and under that point, there's your pre-mill position and like an all-mill, post-mill position. And that's where I will put myself. 
But then there are those who read all Israel and interpret that as all the elect Jews and Gentiles. It's just really Paul's way of saying all the elect will be saved. And then there are those who say that all Israel means all the elect Jews, kind of like what Paul's been saying in Romans chapter 9. Does all Israel refer to all the elect Jews, all the elect Jews and Gentiles, or does it seem to refer in some sense to a mass of Jewish conversion going on? And that's what the dispensationalists believe. Jesus Christ is going to return, and we're going to see a lot of Jews being converted. Well, I think, and again, I say this as I think, because these are some difficult verses, and you'll read a bunch of commentaries, and you'll, you'll try to find yourself a place to land. But we want to be very um, responsible as we work with the text. And, and as we look at the text, 11 times in chapters 9 through 11, the word Israel is used. And every time it is used, it is, Paul uses it very clearly with a specific reference to God's Jewish people. 11 verse 7 jumps out in front of my eyes. What then? Israel obtained? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. He's very clearly referring to the nation of Israel, the people of God, that they failed to obtain what they were seeking. So, and then you look at the context of chapters 9 through 11. Paul's burden, go back to chapter 11, verse 1, has God rejected his people? The definition, his people, there is very clearly the Jewish people, not his people, the church, the people of God who will be with God throughout eternity. He spe- the, the, the contents of nine, context of 9 through 11 is Paul is wrestling with what about the Jews? And I think that then helps us understand verse 26 where he says, all Israel will be saved. Paul's point through these chapters is that God has not forgotten about the Jews. He had a remnant in Isaiah. He chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. He's still the God who chooses among the Jews a remnant. And so I do believe, looking at Romans chapter 11, well, here too, now let's look at those contexts in in those two verses. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers, that a partial hardiness come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. If If you see Paul's line of reasoning, Paul is saying there's a partial, and that's some words important, a a partial hardening so that the fullness of the Gentiles can be saved. And the idea what Paul seems to be saying is that once the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, the partial hardening is removed. A partial hardening so that Gentiles can be saved. And once the fullness is is brought in, then that partial hardening is removed and all Israel is saved. And then that then comes to some understanding there in verse 29, verse 28. Regarding election, they are beloved. See, God God has his elect among the Jews. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, referring to the covenant to Abraham. God has said to Abraham, I will save your people, right? But the nations as well. So amongst the Jews, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. See, verse 31 shows us there that Paul is expecting once the partial hardening is removed, that they too, the Jews, may also now receive mercy. But I like that word now. Some Greek manuscripts don't have it. Other Greek manuscripts have it. So, you know, we can, we can do a rock, paper, scissors on that. But if that word is in the original, then Paul is saying, even as he's writing it, he's seeing Jews even now are being brought in and have continued to be brought in. So this is how I view it. And you can you can you know decide for yourself. But I believe what Paul Paul's wrestle in nine through eleven is what about the Jews? Speaking about the people of Israel. And he believes that the the partial hardening was, was on the Jews so that many Gentiles may be converted, but he sees a day when that partial hardening is removed and we can expect some 
dramatic, if you will, maybe not dramatic, but some influx of the Jews beyond what we would see generally in the last 2,000 years, that we would see kind of like another Pentecost, if you will, of Jews being saved. But So that's really point one. The dispensationalists and us in the all-mill, post-mill camp will, can, can all agree, and, and some disagree, but, but you'll find agreement that there is some expectation that we will see the Jews being converted, and that too would be a sign of God's grace, a sign of the times, specifically that we are approaching the end. But we need to remember the caveat. We can never say with some definitively, oh, it's going to happen now, surely because 10,000 Jews were saved yesterday. And we, we don't, we're not privy to that information. But I, I kind of have a modified one and two position because, and there are Reformed believers who will go with the, the, the two position. The two position is not um, the totality of the Israel, but it's all the elect Jews and Gentiles. And if you go back to chapter 11, you see it like this. Verse 25, there's a partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles And in this way, all Israel will be saved. It could be argued that all Israel, whereas previously Israel refers to the the ethnic people, but the the adjective all, I don't know if that's an adjective, what is all? I've got to consult my grammar book. But there's this expansive idea that Paul is saying all Israel might, in verse 26, mean all the elect Jews and all the elect Gentiles All Israel will be saved. The reason I say that is when you follow his logic to verse 32, Paul says God has consigned all to disobedience, where in verse 31 he says, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy of God shown to you, they also, Paul is speaking about Jew and Gentile in verse 31. Verse 32, God has uh, consigned all to disobedience, all Jews, all Gentiles, so that he he may have mercy on all Jews, all Gentiles. So it could be read in verse 26, could be read that when Paul thinks, see, I don't think you need to choose. I really believe all Israel being saved is the gathering of those Jews that God has chosen throughout eternity, and perhaps in his providence, a large number of Jews before he returns. And in this way, all Israel, Jew and Gentile, will be saved. So I'll let you kind of wrestle through that in your own. I I do believe that we can expect prayerfully that there will be many Jews who have yet to be converted. And with that in mind, we should pray for the salvation of the Jews. And we should send missionaries to Israel. We should send missionaries to uh, New York, you know, to these very large Jewish populations. They need the gospel. And um, so uh, let's, let's pray for the salvation of the Jews. We take away from it this morning this comment that all those whom God has chosen to save in Christ will unfailingly be saved. And that's such a comfort. That includes you and me and includes all of his elect, Jew or Gentile. All those whom he has sovereignly chosen to save will unfailingly be saved. But Paul in Romans 9 through 11 holds out some great confidence that uh, the conversion of the Gentiles will provoke many Jews to be saved. I see that I am at the end of the hour, so uh, next week we're going to look at the conflict between Christ and the Antichrist, the tribulation, great tribulation. So we're we're moving ahead. We saw signs of God's grace announcing the close of the age, and now we're going to see signs of judgment. Um, Any questions you might have as we wait for the kids to come forward? Les, thank you, Lois. That is a good question. So I stayed with the Jewish family, but I don't remember if I ever asked them. I believe they would have um, just... Yes, everything was on Saturday, you know, because that's their whole culture, right? The seventh-day Shabbat. So that was a little bit of a...
a new thing for me, you know, growing up in the world I did, you know, Sunday was the Lord's Day, and so we never did anything on Sunday, but... Yeah, so I think we might talk about this on the radio. Uh, Bear brought it up this week. I do not believe, and I will get kind of agitated, Gentiles should not practice Jewish feasts because we are not culturally, ethnically, racially Jews. Furthermore, um, Christ comes and he is the temple that replaces the other temple. You know, he is the one who is the Passover lamb. So he, he does away with all of that. And that's how Paul actually answers the Jews in Ephesus and Colossae is he says to the Jews, he doesn't say, you guys practice your feast days, but you guys don't need to practice it. He doesn't say that. He says to the Jews, it's done. It's over. And so I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And that would be exactly what Paul did. In fact, that's what got Stephen, the first Christian, to be martyred is the criticism was he spoke against Moses. Now, he would not have gotten himself stoned to death if he had said, we all can still keep the Passover, and we can still keep the Feast of Weeks, and we can still keep the dietary laws, and we, we should never eat swine, never, no, no, never. That would not have gotten him killed. What got him killed was not preaching Jesus was the Messiah. He was speaking against Moses. So, yeah, so, but I think, I think that's actually where the Jews need to come into the full light of the gospel, that these, I do not think it is appropriate for Jews to continue practicing the feast days that have been fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. You know, what you see in the New Testament is go out and make disciples of all nations, beginning where? In Judea. Beginning with the Jews, Jesus says. And then to the Samaritans, the half-Jews. And then to the Gentiles, the ends of the earth. So Jews, half-Jews, and then, <laughs> then us. But the Lord says, go get them all. Jews and Gentiles. So, yeah. So people will say, you know, are the Jews still the people of God? You know, that is probably not the best way. Are they still God's people? God's people, when you use that technical term, um, that's the church. That's the Jewish Gentile olive tree. And so, but I think because of God's covenant with Abraham, that we should still expect that God is saving Abraham's descendants, just like he's, he's saving, um, you know, the Gentiles as well. I said this to somebody recently. There's a verse in, I think, Isaiah. God says to the prophet, you know, it would be too small of a thing for me to save just the Jews. <laughs> the lovely Lord's like, heaven's too big. <laughs> It'll be empty if it's just Jews. I'm going to save lots of people. And so we should take the gospel to everyone. All right. I look, I look forward, forward next week to moving on as we think about the signs of God's judgment, tribulation,